Welcome to GMP The Great, Glorious, and Glamorous, a.k.a. The Going North Podcast, where authors from around the world help you realize that success is tangible. You'll leave with at least one new piece of inspiration or information to help you keep going north. Now let's get on with the show. Today's episode is sponsored by the GoingNorthPodcast.com shop. And if you head over to the wonderful website, cop some merchandise, take a selfie with you rocking the gear, shoot it to yours truly, the host, Dom Brightman at gmail.com, and I will give you a shout out on the show as well, and heck, even tag you on social media as well. So feel free to check out some of the good old merch on Going North Podcast Shop. Com. Now let's get on with some super special awesome content. And today on the Highlight Reel Builder for Authors known as GMP the Great Glorious and Glamorous is the Going North Podcast. And we got another super special awesome human for you today. That's right folks, another super special awesome human for you today because the four pack ab revolution y'all. That's right, because today's guest is the author of four non-fiction books baby. That's right, four of them. As well as an adventure, nature freak, and lifelong yoga and meditation practitioner and to put the cherry on top of the wonderful giant cupcake that she is because she's so freaking fabulous she's also a fellow podcast host who hosts a wonderful podcast with her husband so let's give it up for the one the only tl herself the terrific and legendary tezza lord how you doing today tezza Oh, man, what an intro. I can't live up to that. But I just want to say every single one of us is a fantastic, fabulous person. Well, life is a sheep pirate to a spiritual horse, like you mentioned before the recording. <laughs> yeah. From a sheep pirate to a spirit activist. That's my story. <laughs> there you go so travel the seven seas found the one piece it's like all right too much materialism let me go to the spiritual world now <laughs> right pick, pick a life any life i mean let's just talk about like what's happening today <laughs> <laughs> but of course when you are a writer you are so lucky when you have an incredible life to draw upon for stories because, gosh, I mean, people who write fantastic books at the age of like, you know, 20, I don't know how they do it. Because I had the travel bug, the adventure bug. I just had to get out into the world, you know, and live. And uh, I'm lucky I did because I have enough adventures in me to last for about another, you know, I'd say 30 books. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good indeed. I just that's finished good. writing my first novel. And it was really freeing to be in a space where you can just fantasize things that you can't do in nonfiction. You know, you pretty much when you're nonfiction, people want to listen to the nitty gritty. But for fiction, there are some things, especially when you deal with the spiritual realms, like we tend to do, those of us who are, you know, dedicated to this expanding of consciousness, it's hard to convey that in nonfiction, unless you're dry and kind of a how-to type of thing and i just don't like how-tos i like stories even you know the bible is all stories all the great scriptures are stories <laughs> oh yeah it's so true indeed well, as i'm talking about looking forward to that book and my goodness are you gonna be reading that one too yourself well it's i'm looking for a, an agent right now if any agents are listening to this hey get in contact with me because I had an agent before, but we had to part ways. And so here we are again, you know, manifesting in the universe. Like, what do we need? Well, we think we know what we need. And if we think we know what we need, then it will come to us. But if we don't get it, then that ain't what we needed. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay, too. <laughs> yeah. It may come out in other ways. Who knows, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's in the trying, isn't it? It's in the trying. Just like keep trying. I know a lot of people in in my age group have, who I went to art school, for instance. How many of them have given up making art because they couldn't 
so-called make it. They couldn't make the big bucks. They couldn't get, you know, the, the big exhibits and the museums and the shows interested in them. And like, it's sad because creativity shouldn't be with a dollar sign attached to it. It should be an urge, almost like an itch, I call it in my book, my novel. It's a, it's a good way to express it. It's like an itch you have. And the only way you can scratch that itch is by doing something creative like podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, podcasting is a great, great art form. Look at you. You're a master of it. That background you have, you're just like supersonic like Jetman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got a big point there, especially when I get to have fun with the guests. So my goodness, and creativity. Like when did you first discover your big, wonderful sense of creativity? Because you probably got artwork for like, I guess, what, 100 museums at this point? Oof. Well, if somebody ever came with a tractor trailer to my house in my studio and said, hey, I'll take it all. I was like, wow, take it. Because uh, <laughs> it's nice to have just like the emptiness of, of space to fill up again. But I am pretty prolific. And that's one of the reasons why it's so great, the digital age. You know, you can just keep manipulating the images and change them. And my first book was an art book, We Are One. And it's my manifesto. We are one. That's it. You know, how much more simple can you be? You know, nosotros somos en español. But I took images from my work, and some of them are long gone. They're sold or they're destroyed or whatever. They disappeared into space. And I took images of them, printed them, painted on top of them, then photographed them again and printed them into this spectacular book. And the, the book becomes the art piece. So that was very cool, you know, just to, to take one form and use it into another form. And, and even podcasting. Podcasting is an art form because we're sharing, we're inspiring, we're, you know, focusing on important things, which is what art does. So this is truly, I think, one of the most modern art forms there is. And that's why I wanted to be one. <laughs> I wanted to be a, a podcaster. So Z Lord Podcast started off as a travel log because my husband and I, we've been married for 30 years. We're pretty good buds. We can, you know, we just hash out anything. I know what a celebration, huh? To have that kind of intimacy with somebody. You trust them so much. And both of us had kind of given up when we finally found each other. But I said, hey, we're going to be podcasters. And he said, what? What's a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even know what a podcast was. And we were going off on a six-month camping trip. For like we, we really like to hang out in the wild with nature. And this was before the pandemic in June of 19. So I said, yeah, we're going to be podcasters. And we're going to share with people what it's like to live in uh, you know, a SUV and put your tent up and cook your food on a camp stove and be off the grid and be off the campground even and just see where life takes us. So that's how we started podcasting with our iPhone. That was the only equipment we ever used to this day. <laughs> I'm a no frills, low tech podcaster. And so we traveled all over like the southern part of Canada, came down to the States through Washington and Utah and Nevada and, you know, ended up in Big Ben, Texas, which is down there on the Rio Grande border with Mexico, podcasted every week. So if anybody wants to go on a trip, just go to the early, early episodes of Z Lord podcast and you'll be with us. So then we came home and the pandemic began. And I said, <laughs> Man, we're not going to stop adventuring we're just going to go to the inward adventure instead of looking outside all the time which is really the theme of my life i was always looking out 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 all my books every single one of them was where can i find the thrill the excitement or give it to somebody else <laughs> <laughs> you know? so when the pandemic hit we just said hey we're spending an awful lot of time here quiet like why don't we just go into the inner adventure. And so Z Lord, instead of becoming a travelogue, became a spiritual podcast. So each week to this day, we 
we go and we go into in-depth like um, challenges that stop people from feeling uh, comfortable with this being a spiritual experience that we're having here. So that's my story. What's yours, Dom? Ah, <laughs> uh, the one that involves honey. The one I'm sticking to. Let me stop. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> but that's freaking amazing, though. So my goodness. So, and it does make sense that it's like, hey, might as well switch gears here and to give folks that travel experience because a lot of folks nowadays, um, I guess, really kind of by force with all the nonsense going around, they kind of have to travel and. It's like, hey, might as well get a taste of what it's like to really live outdoors and really get a sense of what it is and kind of in a way to force folks to go the minimization route. And you're so right about the iPhone thing because funny enough, I used to record pr probably my first few 80 episodes on my cell phone with a pair of headphones. <laughs> so it's a okay. It's still doing it to this day is really no problem because it sounds great. Let's do a couple episodes where you get to discuss all the good stuff going in because sometimes and that's probably one of the good parts about the pandemic is that we made decisions to finally just go inside for those that were brave enough to do so <laughs> yeah exactly and the ones who didn't they're the ones who said oh god i'm freaking out i can't see my friends i can't go here i can't go there well the ones who said hey this is what is happening right now and it's not so bad at this moment, but yet I don't know where you live, but everybody's still getting COVID where I live. And so we have to learn to live with it. It's like living with, you know, the monsters outside that, you know, nobody's going to jump on us just because we might think there's a Sasquatch under our bed. You know, we have to learn to live with, there are some scary things in life. But um, talking about nature, I mean, I think that one of my roles as a spirit activist, author, artist, just human being is to spread the love that I have for nature because I've always just been a nature freak. I just love it. I feel so connected to a rock, a worm. I, I, as a kid, I used to just lie down on the ground and just watch tiny little bugs between the blades of grass. Did you ever do that, Dom, when you were a kid? It's, oh, like, yeah. it's like a macro, it's like, you know, our world is a macrocosm, but if you go deep, deep, deep down into the grass and, and separate the little blades of grass, and then you look and you let your eyes get focused, like, you know, it takes a long time. And then the little bugs come out because they're not scared anymore. And there's this whole world there. It's just beaming with activity and variety. And everybody's like, you know, doing their thing. And some of them are getting chomped and some of them are, are like just minding their own business. And so nature, I think, is very, very like alienated for many people. And, and so I try to introduce how to have fun and love nature and not see it as inaccessible because we are part of nature. I mean, we're just like, you know, animals. People forget that human beings are animals. And who's to say, I, there was a great Star Trek. I am a Trekkie. I am not so much into all sci-fi, but you know, The Expanse, <laughs> that's like the modern day Star Trek. And you know, there was a Star Trek movie where this big you know, alien ship came and nobody knew what it was and they thought it was going to bomb us. And so they were armored up. And at the end of the movie, all it was doing was communicating with the whales. And it was sending out like wow, these sounds, and the whales could hear it, but the humans couldn't. So, <laughs> and, and the theme of that movie was ah, what audacity we humans are to think that we're the smartest ones on the planet. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just because we can build skyscrapers and bombs. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> So the unity of all living things is really important to me. And I share that in my books and my podcasting and my art and in everything I do, every post I put on Twitter, every little image I put up on Instagram, every little tidbit I do on Medium, you know, all it's just like um I'm 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 really into 
igniting this love for nature with people. That's my mission. <laughs> Ah, that's what I'm talking about indeed. That's what I'm talking about indeed. So my goodness, what do you think has probably been the greatest gift that nature's given you over these past couple years? <laughs> well, not just years, yeah. These all you mean since the pandemic or just like you know, in general? Eh, yeah, just a couple of years I'm pretty sure a lifetime is probably a whole bunch of gifts. <laughs> okay. To put it in a nutshell, <laughs> nature has taught me that we are all connected. Everything is connected. Like the indigenous people are hip to this. That's why I, I love I love hanging out with the indigenous. I love supporting them and being with them and communicating with them and helping them and assisting them and loving them. So the whole indigenous thing, whether we're talking about, you know, an Amazonian native who's who's sipping ayahuasca or a Pueblo Indian out in the uh, you know, the Arizona area who is just trying to stay connected to the mythology of their tribe. It's all about honoring nature as part of us and us as part of nature. There is no difference. And so that's why so many people came together to support the Indians like at Standing Rock. And now uh, there's an in indigenous person who's the secretary of the interior, you know, for the first time ever in American history. And uh, all sorts of new things are happening. Like there's an indigenous curator at a fancy museum in New York. I mean, the indigenous people, look how long it's taken them to get their degrees and the education that you need to be part of the mainstream. And so nature has told taught me that the most important thing is not how much money I make, how much success I have, what great accolades I have, but how connected am I to you and you and you and like everyone, you know, like we're all brothers and sisters. I'm not into any of this gender stuff, racial stuff, political stuff, I'm not. I lived in the West Indies for over a decade and I've been in places where they'd never seen a white woman. The kids would freak out. They said, oh my God, it's a ghost. <laughs> 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 you know, at, at one point I was so pissed off at American politics. I, I kept hearing love it or leave it. So I left and I roamed the Caribbean. That's why I call myself a she pirate. Because you know, I got into some funky things, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of inter-island and interconnection stuff, and wanted to live in the jungle. I wanted to live with simple people who sit around and talk about, like, "Hey, how, how was your chicken today? <laughs> <laughs> Did you remember to feed the goat?" <laughs> I was watching this dude once, it was, I think it was Jamaica. He had a little radio and he was dancing. Yeah, everybody in Jamaica dances like Dom, you'd fit right in Jamaica. Everybody's moving. And he was he was off to water his goat. And literally, I was just sitting there watching him. He would take two steps forward and then he'd take three steps back. And then he'd take two steps forward, maybe two more. <laughs> and then he'd take <laughs> and he'd twirl around and he was just dancing in the middle of nowhere, the bush, instead of just saying, I've got to go feed my goat and got to, you know, got to do that. And then I got to go do this and got to go do that and got to make money and, you know, protest this. I mean, no, man, he was so in the moment. He was dancing and he was eventually going to water his goat, but he knew his goat would be still there by the time he finished his relaxing and intriguing way of being so totally present so i just watched him i said man that guy is really in the moment i couldn't do that <laughs> <laughs> uh, nature being in nature even watching an animal like we talked about earlier watching how animals if you get get really quiet they do come to you if they feel safe if they don't feel any vibe, like, you know, this, this other animal here is weird. I don't think I want to go near them. But if 
if I was meditating once in a field and a little bird landed on top of my head. And that was freaky. I felt the little little feet moving around, moving around, moving around. And I just felt blessed. I said, wow, this has never happened to me in my whole life. And that bird, trust me. I thought, how special. <laughs> and the next day that bird returned because I was in the same field. Mind you, it was a safe place also. Like all, I was in like a hundred acre sanctuary where there was a lot of meditation going on, like a yoga ashram. I've done a lot of, lot of deep practice with meditation, being with people who uplift your spirits, you know, just by being in their presence. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah, so nature has taught me that too. We have to be really careful about every single thought we keep in our mind. And if we find ourselves having a negative thought or a disturbing thought or just fearful thought, just to watch it and say, wow, you know, I could choose to change it, flip it around and just make it become love, just love, the opposite of fear. And that's a choice thing. So nature has, has taught me that even when there's some bad shit happening, like a hurricane. I live in hurricane territory. I've gone through a lot of what I call killer hurricanes. People by the thousands get killed. You know, they all go rushing to the church. They think the church is going to save them and bang, the roof collapses and a thousand or more are killed in one instant. So hurricanes are deadly. But I take a hurricane over a over a fire, a wildfire, any day because a hurricane you can prepare for. A wildfire sometimes no, you just have to run for your life. But in nature, when something bad happens, there's always a balance. If we didn't have the hurricanes, we would not have the distribution of moisture. Just plain and simple. It's like, you know, we have a certain amount of water on this planet. It gets distributed by, you know, rising up and falling down and rising up and falling down. It's not like all of a sudden the creator decided to make, you know, a, a million zillion more gallons of water. No, there's a container, uh, uh, you know, it's almost like we're in a terrarium. There's a certain amount of moisture on this planet and it gets recycled and it gets reused. And so when a hurricane comes along, yes, it can be deadly. That's nature, but it can also be beautiful. And if we look at the storm from far off and we see the storm brewing, <clears throat> brewing <laughs> it can be like startling and inspiring. And you just can't speak when you see something tremendous happening in nature. So I love yeah. nature, it's a great teacher. That's right. It's a teacher that has all the apples already. <laughs> well, yeah. But sometimes they're just little tiny seeds. And the apple has not yet been nourished. And the apples have to be nourished. They have to have the moisture. Yeah. But nature, nature teaches us if we can just get still enough to commune with it. So, okay, in our current civilization... There's a lot of people who are urban and they can't connect with nature as much as people who live in, you know, rural areas. So they might have a little tree down the block. They could go make friends with that tree. They could give it a little pat every time they go by and say, hey, how you doing today? You know, talk to it, hum with it, dance with it a little feel for it if it starts getting sick you know or mourn it if it gets killed somehow with a disease or has to be torn down you know we can connect with any organism it doesn't have to be a big huge human being <laughs> that we love yeah there's there's a there's a really old book i think it's uh communion with all life it starts off with the, with the, you know, this dog who became famous before Rin Tin Tin, Strongheart. Strongheart was an awesome dog, a German dog. That's Rin Tin Tin was also a German shepherd. Rin Tin Tin was a movie star. 
Marine Tin Tin was almost like psychic. I mean, Strongheart. Strongheart was the first one, and and Strongheart's the first uh, story in this book. And and then the last story in the book was about a man who had a friend of a fly, <laughs> just a house fly, and this house fly would come and sit on his finger, and the man and the fly had a friendship. I mean, it sounds ridiculous almost because a fly doesn't live that long, but yet the man truly felt that this fly was his friend. You know, so somebody who lives in an apartment who has no ability to go out into nature, you know, they can relate to that. They can definitely relate to making friends with even a funny little fly that other people think are an annoyance. They'll just swat it without even thinking twice. Or if they're a Buddhist, they won't do that. They will, you know, lovingly feed it probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think for me, nature has been the biggest teacher of all. Ah, uh, that's what I'm talking about indeed. That's what I'm talking about indeed. Heck, it's kind of funny because when you mentioned the hurricanes, it reminded me, I think it was, well, I guess it's not your first book, I guess your third book, what was it The Eye of the Storm? We actually was teaching in the, the eye, yoga. In the eye. Oh, in the eye. Okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah, where I was teaching yoga and meditation to young girls, at risk girls who got caught and they were put in prison. And they were mad and they were anxious and they were just like too crowded. And, you know, prison is not a fun thing, but especially if you're a juvie. So that book was really important to me because I related to them because that could have been me. I could have been caught earlier in life because eventually I was caught. I, I did spend time in prison, but in not in this country, in, in a third world country, which to me is worse. As you know, you don't even get a decent meal. You don't get a decent bed. It's dangerous. So In the Eye um, was a wonderful book to write because I, at the same time as I was teaching these girls techniques about how to chill out and be happy and to breathe deeply and just connect with their inner power. The empowerment of breath is so strong. A hurricane was coming. It was Hurricane Charlie, and it was coming directly for the facility, right smack dab in this little tiny town, this little pissant cow flat town in the middle of Florida called Bowling Green. And, it, and so the book shows the hurricane coming closer and closer and closer as the girls get more and more able to deal with the, the stress of life. And at the end... It was a direct hit right on the facility, but yet the girls who chose to come to the class, because a lot of them just said, I ain't going to do you no know, yoga, no meditation. Come on, that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> They're the ones who really had a hard time on top of everything else that was going on in their lives with the hurricane coming. But the ones... I call them the yoga girls who were like gang girls and urban and rural. They have gangs in little tiny towns too. And they're all tattooed and they're all like, you know, they started off being pissed off like everybody else. But as soon as they learned to breathe, which is what yoga is really based on, the union of breath with everything, mind, body, spirit, all connected with breath, which is consciousness. If we're not breathing, we're not alive. So it's consciousness, plain and simple. And so when the girls, the yoga girls learn these things, even just with the first breath, you get it. You get hit over the head. Like, wow, that's <laughs> like, what's this stuff happening in my head? I, I, I see all these white lights, sparkly. I, and I said, you know, that's called oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> so the hurricane comes and the yoga girls are like chilled out like okay there's a hurricane coming no big deal and everybody else around them is in a panic freaking out thinking they're going to die so yeah nature man nature can be tough and life is tough 
And nature teaches us how to deal with the toughness. Yeah. So what would you consider probably your toughest life experience that actually still sticks with you to this day as a lesson? <laughs> I'm still in it. <laughs> I, <laughs> Thus far, I guess. <laughs> Well, I've had, I had a serious injury the second day of this beautiful year, 2022. I had a serious injury that is like life altering. And so I broke my femur in a freak accident. It's major. And so, wow, I've been thinking about that and like saying, okay, universe, what am I supposed to learn from this? Because your mobility is really like comes to a screeching halt when you break the major bone of your body. So being injured, I would say, even though I was in jail for a while, a couple months, okay, I, I survived that. That also was like 40 years ago. So I've, I've healed from that terrible experience. I would have said that was the worst experience, but I deserved it. <laughs> Everything <laughs> I did leading up to that, I needed to like chill out and like just calm down. Everything I had done leading up to going to prison, even though I was innocent of the charge, but I saw all the things I'd done as a sheep pirate up on the walls. I needed to have that time in prison. But I was finally released after three months because the charges were ridiculous. They were not true. But this injury, when somebody has like a a halt to their life, just like the pandemic halted a lot of our lives. And we have to just learn to accept it. So I do, every day I do broke leg yoga, which is not a pretty thing to look at. <laughs> you know, like it's, I've had to adapt. I've had to learn how to do what I can. But you know, you can do yoga, which is my thing, my path. I love yoga. It's helped my body because I, had scoliosis as since a young child, probably from falling out of a tree, because I could, just couldn't stop from climbing trees and my spine got messed up. And um, as soon as I started doing yoga at the age of 18, I had relief. So that's the thing about life. You know, when you find relief, you do it. Whatever it was that gave you relief. And for me, yoga and meditation, they give the most beneficial relief of anything. I've ever done and until I find something that's better I'm going to stick with it <laughs> so I'm healing and I would say this is the biggest challenge to just accept my limitations ah there you go that's right accept the limitations and pressing that pause button y'all that's right indeed yeah because some of the pose I don't know all of them but it's just the ones that come to mind it's like uh that best is probably extra hard to pull off <laughs> with broken fever that's gotta suck <laughs> yeah it, it's uh, ironic ironic too because people who know me it's like what Tezza Lord has a what they call it a femoral hip fracture it's much more than just a broken femur it's way up there and whew, everybody's like I don't know that is weird talk about the irony of life it's like things we think could never happen well <laughs> don't happen <laughs> 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 and and i and i love that about life you know to me that's the magic of life to be ready for anything as it comes and not that we go around in fear that something bad is going to happen but to love whatever happens even if it's challenging. And like right now, we're in the midst of so many challenges, you know, and we, we as a combined global family of humans, we're like teeny boppers, you know, on <laughs> the line of evolution, you know, in another hundred years, we will be so much more evolved. And all of us will have this beautiful, you know, roasted nut color. We won't have white and black and pink and yellow. Well, you know, everybody is becoming intermingled. And I love that. And that's really because of the digital age. You know, before we had the internet, I mean, okay, places I lived in the Caribbean, they never had even TV. 
back in the 70s. I was roaming the Caribbean in the 70s. You probably weren't even born then, were you, Dom? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's a great thing to adventure. I, I encourage everybody, you know, as soon as you can, just see the world. Uh, that's what I'm talking about indeed. That's right. See the world indeed. That's right. Third eye or not, see the world, y'all. Glasses or not, see the world indeed. So my goodness, so since you've been on this wonderful podcast tour, spreading the good word of love being the weapon of mass illumination, that's probably one of your best one-liners ever. Is there a question that you wish you'd be asked more often when you're on these podcasts? Hmm question that i wish would be oh, well don't ask me if i've ever seen ufos because whew, <laughs> i get in big trouble because yes i have so <laughs> <laughs> i don't know you know the spontaneity of of the moment is where i'm at it's like i i have so much to, to think about and so many experiences but yet this place right here right now right before me is the most exciting thing there is i mean i don't want to talk about the old books that i've written because i'm so excited about the next one that's coming up you know i i really i i'm thrilled with being in the present moment that's my goal uh, okay cool you don't think the government found out about your ufo sightings and decided to break the femur did you <laughs> I think the government like doesn't give a crap about me. <laughs> wow, we need to talk about it more. That's for sure. We need to talk about things that are real. And finally, you know, we are in our society. We can finally talk about things that were taboo for a long time, like even death. Okay. Yeah. A lot of time, people. No, no, no. I don't want to hear about that. Well, death is important to talk about because. If you don't see it as part of life, then you get freaked out. Hey, death is part of life. And UFOs, hey, they have been around a long time. <laughs> My parents saw them. I've seen them. Lots of people have seen them. Hello, government. Just like get it out. Get it. Get over with it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. It is the beauty of the times where we get to have those subjects. And you're right about death because... um death is real death is really real actually especially these past couple of weeks because sadly enough a couple of weeks ago a person that was booked on the show actually passed away a month before he was about to record because i was doing my usual snooping thing and i'm like oh crap <laughs> because i saw a facebook post that his wife post like hey this is um so and so's uh wife and um he actually passed away suddenly when he was really in the time of his life where he's really channeling his spiritual side and really getting to the Christian side of life. And the past guest who guest on the show back in 2021, he passed away from a heart attack last week. So <laughs> death is something we have to really come to grips with when in this life that we're in and really have to make sure we live the life that we truly want to live and do the things we want to do now because our time, we have no idea when our time's up in this hourglass. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's not something to be freaked out about because, oh, I believe in reincarnation. That's the only thing that works for me. I mean, nothing else made sense as a kid, even like, huh? How come some people can just like play the piano like that at three? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> that shall been in before. <laughs> like, even with somebody like Bob Dylan, where did he come up with all this stuff? With, you know, like the words, just see. So the more we talk about the fact that it's a reality that we are animals and, and it's not like we're guaranteed anything. We, we have an animal existence. We are birth, life, and one day there's going to be a closure to it. And it's a beautiful thing actually to embrace it as an opportunity to plug into it's the highest thing that a human can have like in the yoga world we actually call it maha samadhi when a person dies that means they take the gift of enlightenment 
they have become en totally enlightened because they have left their body. So it's called maha, which means the highest samadhi, which is like the state of mind that you get into when you meditate. You take maha samadhi when you die. You don't just like end anything. You've taken like the elevator to the top. <laughs> and you are released. You are released from the, uh, the hard lessons that we have to learn here as humans. Now, that doesn't mean I'm looking forward to dying. But when you look at it that way, as it being an elevated state that is going to happen someday, then there's nothing to fear. And okay, some people, when I was a kid, of course, you know, we were taught heaven and hell. That doesn't work for me anymore. That's a, that's a paradigm that I have left behind because it doesn't, it doesn't interface with my experiences in meditation. And I have also been at the bedside of both my parents as they left their bodies 30 years apart. And I have experienced the energy that happens, the energy shift from a loved one into another loved one. There's a shift of energy. You can actually feel it in the room when you're with a, somebody who is leaving their body. Mm. And it's not something that you can read about and say, oh, yeah, that's cool. But when you experience it, it's an altered state. I mean, it really gets your attention. And so uh, my first book, We Are One, actually describes what happened when I was with my father. And that's why I was compelled to do that book, to share the oneness. As my dad was leaving, he said to me, he said, isn't it amazing that we are all one and that some of us just don't get to know it until it's too late? Mm -hmm. I said, wow, oh, thanks, Dad. That's the way I've always felt. But you're like my, you're my proof. He gave me that gift and he saw it as he was leaving his body. He felt it. He saw it. And it is true. It is really true. Energetically. Through consciousness, we are all one. Ah, beautiful indeed, beautiful indeed. Because when you mention that, I'm like, wow, because I remember your dad being atheist and your mom being an excommunicated Catholic, right? Oh, boy, yeah, you remember well. Well, he was agnostic. Right? There's a difference. An agnostic person knows something's, ah, okay. going on. something's going on. An atheist... Really, I think they, they get hung up on semantics. You know, if you used another word beside God, like, okay, do you like sacred? Or do you like energy? <laughs> Just <laughs> get another word. They can't deny there's energy. <laughs> my dad was an agnostic, yes. My mom got excommunicated from Catholicism when she married him because that's the way it is when you um, don't say you're going to raise the children a certain way when you're in, in the Catholic religion. But she eventually gave us a choice, my sister and I, and said at the age of seven, oh, what do you want to do? You know, And I, I really liked Catholicism. I liked the pomp and circumstance and the incense and the rituals. I love ritual. You know, the more rituals we do in life, it's so important. This podcasting is a ritual. You know, it's sacred. Even though we have a lot of laughs and jokes and everything, it's a sacred thing to... Focus your intention. So I chose to become Catholic. My sister did too. I got baptized at the age of seven and got re received Holy Communion. That's the first sacrament, like, you know, a few days later. And, and that was my story. But I am a recovering Catholic. Besides <laughs> 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 a recovering addict. <laughs> uh. I get you, I get you. So I guess folks need to pick up that We Are One book indeed to, I guess, find out the difference indeed. That's right, indeed. That's right, indeed. That's right, indeed. Well, fun question, but now I'm like, okay, well, then again, you're probably excited about this novel and looking for an agent. So this upcoming novel of yours, if it was a food, what would it be and why? Oh, it's a yummy, cream-filled, like chocolate-flavored, weird-looking a uh, cupcake because it's it's so different and it's you look at it and you'll say wow what planet did this come from is it is it a, <laughs> right? 
is it an alien cupcake or is it... <laughs> it's, it's it's dangerous you you are saying if i take a bite of that is it gonna like you know change me am i gonna am i going to be forever <laughs> in another state of mind yes it's a, it's a very alien looking but yummy once you have brave enough to take a bite cupcake <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. And we didn't talk about Zen love. So there's the, the first book, We Are One, that's an art book, my manifesto. Love is the weapon of mass elimination. Then there was Zen love. Oh, the In the Eye, which is the story about teaching the girls as the hurricane comes. That's when I began the nonfiction narratives. Then there's Zen love. And the third one the of the, of the nonfiction narratives, my fourth book is hybrid vigor. So we didn't really talk about those two, but just briefly, Zen love is a true story of a family that's very dysfunctional, my family, and how I spiritualized all the problems. I dealt with all the challenges of being a stepmom who was in charge of the kids because the bio mom, I called her the bio mom, was incapable of raising the kids. A lot of people have this situation these days. So how did I deal with it? I just filled it with love and and combated any negative with positive and spiritual and love. And it there were a lot of dramatic things that happened. And the journey was not just all peaceful and love and kindness. It was like going over one cliff after the next cliff after the next, you know, dra dramatic crises after the next. But Throughout it all, I, I really believe that we can combat any negative with love and because I lived it. So that's Zen love. And then the last nonfiction narrative I did is called Hybrid Vigor, which is how animals have taught me so much about my being a human, made me better human to relate to my brothers and sister animals. And I give specific incidences and experiences and what they taught me so that was a real pleasure the star of the book is a rooster mr roosty is <laughs> <laughs> his role is to go around and wake people up wake up everybody that's the <laughs> that's the theme of hybrid vigor wake up <laughs> uh, stay woke my friend stay woke Oh, sweet. Definitely got to check that out. Sounds like I should have copped Hybrid Vigor first. Because <laughs> I copped well, the other yeah. two first on audio. But hey, I'll, I'll just capture the other two. I got two on audio, so I'll get the other two on audio. And folks yeah. should check them out, too, since you're reading them. So we're coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive. And that oh, is... Oh, boy, lucky me. Drum roll. That's right, drum roll and not an egg roll. So if you're to wake up tomorrow, you're at 25 again, but you're still in 2022 with all of your knowledge and experience, what advice would you give to yourself? I would say just keep doing what, exactly what you did before because my, you know, everything that comes toward us in life, no regrets, no regrets at all. I would, I would do more of what I did and be so grateful. I have no regrets about anything. And it was, uh, you know, even being in prison, <laughs> even being thrown in, even dealing with all the um, maniacal people who I've had to deal with. I, I would not want to be 25 again, first of all. I am a gorgeous 74-year-old. <laughs> and I have earned every single one of my little laugh lines and these beautiful silver hairs I have. I, I feel, wow, what a, what a privilege it is to live this long, beautiful life and to share with others that the adventure of life is magical. Whatever comes is just magical because I chose to see it that way. And the, when I was 25, I was pissed off. I was really pissed off. So if anything, I would say, oh God, how can I get out of here? <laughs> I want to be 74 again and be, and be mellow. And I had already started to meditate. When I was 25, I had already done yoga and meditation for, you know, since I was 18. I had those tools, but I said, nah, man, I want to party. 
<laughs> I was really into partying. You know, I like my rum and I like my sleeve. I'm a Rasta girl. I've lived in the hills with the Rastafari. You know, I know about Ja. So I would say to anybody who's 25, just enjoy your life and see what Ja is bringing you and make it iri. And, you know, just, just be in the moment and whatever comes to you is your special, special, special magic. Ah, uh, that's what I'm talking about indeed. And I was thinking like 63, I wasn't thinking 74. My goodness, all right. She's taking good care of herself, y'all. She's taking mighty great care of herself indeed. So even more reason to check out that Hybrid Vigor book indeed. That's right, the that's And right, indeed. my YouTube channel, which I, because I'm a lifelong yogi, I give free yoga classes. It's called the Seven Chakras, each chakra which is like a different center of energy has a different class so if anybody wants to really learn true yoga not you know made up i call it fast food yoga which is happening today because <laughs> yoga is really a sacred ritual it's like a prayer with your body so go to my youtube channel i also put up mind stillers which are short little guided mm, snippets that can calm people and that's my gift to the world Hey, when you got a chill, smooth voice like that, you kind of have to do that indeed, because I freaking love it indeed. So for those who need to keep in contact with you and keep up with your journey, especially when book number five launches, are there any other places where folks should follow you? Yeah, the teslalord.com. Please join my army of the love of light. And you just sign up and you'll find out about all the other cool things that I'm doing all the time. And I'm on, you know, Twitter and all the other things. I don't. We have a private sanctuary on Facebook. It's called We Are One Love. It's kind of a little we, W-E, just the letter R, the number one, and big L-O-V-E. So it's a private place. Oh, no assholes. They get kicked out. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, you gotta stick with Amen. the winners. You gotta keep the vibration high. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, yeah, those gotta stay out somewhere. Yeah, wherever that where is, <laughs> just not here, right? <laughs> yeah, we get to create our happiness ourselves. We don't have to even in, if you're in jail. So I found that out. If you're in jail, if you're in a society that you think is really not right, hey, you can still be happy. Because you don't have to let anything on the outside interfere with your inner state of being in that moment. Ah, uh, yeah. That's right, indeed. Well, we got to have you back on with book number five launch because this has been fun on the bun, indeed. That's right, all the good buns, indeed. So, any parting words before we close up shop, Tezza? Well, just remember, folks, that love, the opposite of fear, anxiety, stress, etc., love is the weapon of mass illumination. Hey, you. Yeah, you. The one listening right now. Thanks a bunch for sharing some of your time out of your day to listen to this podcast. To take it to the next level, be sure to share it with someone that you care about and that would get something out of this podcast, too. Advance others to advance your self.